Hello, hello, love bugs. Welcome back and thank you for joining me. I am on my fourth day, the end of my fourth day without any internet services. Please, if you can, join me in a moment of visualization and I want you to visualize a little green light lighting up next to the word internet on a wonderful black modem. <laughs> the green light, I know the green light is coming soon. Until then, please just know that I love you all so much that I I'm traveling to the library in a nearby town to upload these videos for you. And I am currently having a Mars transit. Mars is the greater malefic in my chart because I was born during the day. It's in my 10th house and I'm determined to persist through the challenges to serve my, my mission as a messenger for the spirit world. So let's do this! Okay, I've got some highly specific Mars in Gemini questions from all of you and let us let us answer them. Okay, so we have a question from a subscriber. You may hear construction noises outside the window, also part of my Mars transit, and I want you just to ignore those, okay? So this is from a subscriber named Michael and he said, I've been watching a lot of past life stories all mm, oh, past lives. Oh, that's one of my favorite topics. Yes, reincarnation. Thank you. Reincarnation. Yes, reincarnation is a gift because it allows us to be many things. So if you're dissatisfied in some way <laughs> with who you are right now, maybe you wish you were a different gender or you had a different um, station in life or a different hair color. All of that is possible for you. Maybe you want a different profession. That is possible for you. That is the gift of reincarnation. We get to be as many things as we would like to be throughout time and space. It is an incredible gift. Yes. Yes to past lives. So Michael's been watching past life stories and near-death experiences. Um, and he says this is similar to something that he has went through. Mm -hmm. He says, I haven't looked into OBEs, which stands for out of body experiences. Out of body experiences are similar to near death experiences in the sense that in both cases, the soul detaches from the physical body. Um, the difference is with an out-of-body experience, um, the soul, well actually, the, you know what, that's actually really, really interesting. So the body, I was going to say that with an out-of-body experience, the soul returns to the body, but that is true in both cases. So the main difference is in an out-of-body experience, often this can be intentional. So there are people that specialize in out-of-body experiences that learn to travel out of their body and they have experiences, or these can occur accidentally, but an out-of-body experience is different than a near-death experience in the sense that the physical body does not die. Um, and the physical body remains alive. Often the out-of-body experience can happen in a state that's in between sleep and wakefulness, sort of like lucid dreaming. So often it can happen when one is falling asleep or when one is um, coming back to the body after traveling out and about during the sleep state. So, the question is, when a person returns from an out-of-body experience, would they feel their breath re-enter into their physical body along with taking a few minutes to remember who they are and where they are? Okay, so there are many ways that you could return to the physical body after an out-of-body experience. I have had a couple out-of-body experiences myself. The, so each has been different actually. So one that comes to mind, what actually stands out to me the most, um, and where I think that the out-of-body experience really differs from near-death experiences. Um, <laughs> besides the love factor 
usually like in an out-of-body experience, you remain close to the earth. So when I think of my out-of-body experiences, what really strikes me is seeing my physical body and not being in it. Um, and that's actually like, that can be kind of disquieting. That can be kind of scary. Um, so I've had, I've had before like out-of-body experiences. The body appears to be kind of dead. It's not, um, but when you're not in the body and you see your body, it's you in my I can only speak for myself but like there's some recognition no it's not a recognition that it's you because it doesn't feel like it's you like you are the consciousness that is outside of the body but there's a recognition that the body is where your consciousness often is residing so it's like, I can remember being out of my physical body, and often I'm, this is just my experience, but like, I'm often near the ceiling or above the physical body in some way. So like, looking down at my physical body, I had some experiences starting when I was young, and then afterwards I would be kind of like, disquieted upon seeing my physical body in similar positions, like in photographs taken of me um, when I was laying on the couch or like, stuff like that. So. There, what was the question? Like the question is, does a person feel their breath re-enter into their physical body? This depends. I think generally you probably would not, unless you were explicitly trained to leave your physical body. And it is my understanding that experiments have been performed, etc., where people come to specialize in leaving the physical body. Um, this can be connected to remote viewing or other things. Um, and in that case, yes, some people may report even pain. Um, there can be a, there definitely when you're not in the physical body, there's definitely a feeling of freedom. There's definitely like sensations in my experience of like flying or floating, being able to move, um, yeah, as I describe this to you guys, I realize I'm probably out of my body more than, a lot more than I remember. When you're not in your physical body, um, it's quite easy to move through intention alone. Um, like simply direct, like lean into it and you move across space. So there's a lightness and a freedom of motion. And so I think rather than like noticing your breath, um, upon entering the physical body, something that you would notice is probably the pain or discomfort. Now, I think I probably have more pain in my body. Some of you will know I have a very rare allergic condition um, and some medical mystery things. Um, so I probably have more pain, but still, like I think there's pain, just general discomfort to physicality. And you may notice that. You may notice just a strange feeling of going from being not solid to like, feeling heavy or solid or like you could notice tingle sensations. I mean, you might notice the breath, but when I think on like across accounts of all the times where like I remember re-entering the body, the breath is not what stands out to me. It's the physical senses, like suddenly seeing from a new vantage point, particularly sounds for me have been really strong and feeling and pain, but like the five senses of the physical body, um, especially sound. Um, I, for some reason, be, when being out of my, my, this is just my own experience, but when being out of the physical body, I don't tend to notice sound. Um, I, I definitely have vision still, like full vision, um, but I definitely don't have, don't notice like when I'm out of the physical body, smell or sound. Um, so those senses are very overwhelming when re-entering the physical body. Um, Michael asked, okay, would it take them a few minutes to remember who they are and where they are? Um, I think this depends on if you left your body intentionally or unintentionally. So I can think of one prominent encounter, um, where I did not intend to leave my body but I did. 
and awakening in my body again. Not over. Not only was I overwhelmed by the sounds and the senses, like especially smell and feeling. Um, yes, I did not know who I was. Uh, it it took a while to reboot. For sure, yeah, yeah, definitely more than a couple minutes. So an example is like I woke up in my body again or came back into my body and initially was very disoriented um, and there was an alarm going off on like an old style cell phone, like beep, beep, beep. And I noticed the sound, but I had no recollection of where I was, who I was, and no recollection of what a cell phone was. So I had no way of knowing like where the sound could have come from. Um, and it took several minutes and the phone was right next to me. It's like under my pillow. Like it took me several minutes to even know that it was a phone. Like I didn't even register it as an identifiable object for several minutes. Um, I didn't know what country I was in. I didn't know my name. I didn't recognize my face, um, etc. So there are there is not one answer to these questions on out of body experiences. Just like you cannot provide one answer to near death experiences, because there's many ways of getting to a near death experience. For example, right? Like the experience that someone will have in leaving their body if they're drowning is going to be really different than if they died by suicide or a car crash or something like that. And I feel like with out of body experiences, it's really similar as well. Like if you're an if you work for an intelligence agency and you've received special training on how to leave your physical body in order to perform certain psychic missions, just a, an example, um, that experience is probably going to be very different and there may be a protocol and that protocol may involve certain um, aspects of re-entry that may focus heavily on the breath or things like that, perhaps, possibly, I truly don't know. Um, but that's like one example. Um, but that may be very different than if you accidentally slip out of your physical body or have like a recollection um, in between sleep. Because it is my understanding for sure that many of us leave our physical body um, all, not every night necessarily, but many nights. And we will travel like to the higher realms, we will meet with our guides, loved ones on the other side, we will plan um, events of our life or just kind of uh, confirm details of events that will happen in the following days in our earthly life. There can be a leaving of the physical body. Um, there is what is called the silver cord, which it connects the physical body to the soul consciousness or to the higher realms. Um, I think often when a person has a recall, perhaps something has gone wrong with that factor. Um, and I'm not sure exactly why that would be. Uh, but just to say, there are many ways that you could end up out of your body. Uh, there are other examples as well of how you could end up out of your body, um, which could involve not death, but just extreme fear. Um, so often when we see horrific things, we believe that the soul or person who experienced those things is suffering. Um, but there is actually like a natural instinct, just like if you like are going to put your hand in a fire or like a stove, like you, you don't even think about it. Your instinct just pulls your hand away, like hot. No, there's the exact same instinct with the soul and the body. Like if your body, if you feel your body is at grave risk, even if you're wrong, often the soul will leave. And that can be, that can create an out-of-body experience, even if the body isn't harmed. And that could include extreme fear, psychologically, emotionally, physically. And you leave the body and then you can have an out-of-body experience. Um, I do think out-of-body experiences can happen as well um, due to illness or pain in the physical body. There is not an actual death of the physical body, so it's not an NDE, um, but there's still a stepping out of the body. So different souls are, are locked or unlocked to the physical body more or less. <laughs> so there can be early childhood experiences, etc. Um, for example, like I have over 100 food allergies um, and over 50 known inhaled allergies, 
meaning I faced anaphylaxis a lot as a child, um, meaning my airways closed a lot, etc. And I left the physical body probably more than most throughout my life due to these experiences. So now, like I'm probably more unlocked from the physical body uh, and more prone to probably leaving or separating from the physical body than most, I would guess. Um, but in terms of my memories of being out of body, um, there's, I don't remember a lot of incidents of it. Um, probably like less than 10. Uh, but I don't think we're meant to remember. Like I think most of us leave our body at least uh, several times a week, like during our sleep state and we don't remember and that's how it's meant to be. Um, there's meant to be a separation of memory between the times we're out of the body and inside the body. Uh, consciousness experienced inside the body is collected in a stream of memories related to being inside of the body. And outside of the body, memory is stored in a different location. Okay, so Michael also asked, have you ever had a spirit touch your leg three times to wake you up because you were running late? Um, yes. Okay, so that's going to be like probably a shocking answer, but yes, I have. Um, yes. I don't know about because I was running late, but um, I should mention I, um, I did talk about this before in a series of videos, but it scared people, so I privated the videos, but I actually grew up in a really haunted house, and I have been woken up by spirits touching my leg. I don't know why, um, but, like, yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly why they wouldn't just let me sleep at certain times, um, but I've definitely been touched by spirits. Uh, well, I'm awake as well, um, and yeah, I mean, I have been, I've definitely been helped by spirits touching me, um, to prevent harm. Like, for example, uh, one time I was go trying to go upstairs and a spirit kind of pulled on my hair, causing me to come down and then that missed something falling from the stairs, like, that would have fallen on me and I was just, like, little, but I had stepped aside because they pulled my hair. Now that's going to sound really shocking. I hope that doesn't freak anybody out, but that, that's one example. So yes, I've definitely been touched by spirits. Um, I, had an, I had a time of being touched and awoken from a dream, and the dream was about getting in a car accident, um, and it was a warning about getting in a car accident that day. So I wasn't running late, but a spirit did wake me up. Um, or... Yeah, I mean spirit, it probably was an angel, um, woke me up and I did get in that car accident. I got in the car accident later that day, um, but it was m more minor than it was shown. And I, I didn't want to go, but I had to go because I was like picking up my best friend at the airport. No one else could go do it, um, but I, w I anticipated the risk. And so I drove slower, etc. And in the end, it harmed my car, but it didn't harm me. And I think, like, I was awoken by a guide or angel. How are we doing that time? Yeah, like, by a guide or angel. So I would remember the dream. So I would really remember and take precautions, which I did. Um, but I, yeah, I definitely had spirits touch me. And I don't always know why. You know, we don't always know why. Um, but I've definitely experienced that. And yeah, yeah, spirits, including, I think mainly like if you're touched by a spirit and it's in a helpful way, it's your guardian angel. So normally the guides reside in the higher realms and they guide us like through feelings, through implanting helpful thoughts in our mind, through bringing us to information that will help us on our journey, through sending support of others into our lives in those ways. But it's actually the guardian angel that is always around us um, that intervenes directly for our safety. Um, so like when people say that, you know, someone pulled them out of a burning vehicle or something like that and then disappeared, that's their guardian angel. So they will intervene directly um, to save our life or other serious matters. They are not permitted to intervene in non-life-threatening matters unless specifically asked 
and guardian angels are not permitted to intervene with our personal karma. So if we have something that is part of our life plan that is a difficult event, like we're going to get fired or our spouse is going to leave us or something, but it's part of the life plan, um, our guardian angel cannot stop that from happening. They can provide comfort or peace to us um, when it's happening, like feelings of comfort or peace or harmonious um, thought patterns or energies, but they can't stop our fate, if that makes sense. Um, but in like unexpected events or we find ourselves in an unsafe situation and it, we, it's not specifically of our benefit to experience that trauma or lack of safety, they can intervene um, in various, various ways. So that's, I don't know why, but I just felt compelled to share that with you. Now I have one more um, and I don't have this person's name, but she asked, Please, can you talk about certain people being bad for you in a future video? I would love to hear more about that from you. So I think I mentioned in a past uncut that certain people are bad for us. Um, and they, yeah, I mean, that's true. So think about it like this. Who do you want to be? Um, this is what I meant by it. So it's like, who do I want to be in this world? So if I want to be someone who is kind, someone whose heart is filled with hope, um, someone who is creative, self-assured, um, helpful. So like, let's say those are qualities that you want to be. Um, the people that are good for you are the people that bring out those qualities within you. And when I say people, I don't just mean like friends, family, coworkers, colleagues, strangers, but I also mean like the people we watch online. So like if it's your goal to be a more helpful person, then if you're consuming content from a person that like after you consume the content, like you feel like you want to be more helpful or it makes you more helpful, then that person's good for you because they're bringing out like the qualities in you that you want to be. So that's good. But a person that would be bad for you is someone who shapes you in ways that go against the core nature of who you want to be. Um, so I have people like this in my life for sure. Like I'm here to learn trust and faith and to cultivate that sense of connectedness to the spirit world. And sometimes if I, sp I spend time um, around certain people who don't believe, like they, they don't believe anything. like. They are very skeptical, they lack faith, um, overly, overly analytical. I love science, you guys, like I love science. And I believe that like a very wonderful individual is someone who's well-versed in science and spirituality. Um, but there are certain people where, and it's not their fault, but after I spend time with them, it's like I leave and my faith is like sort of shattered. Like their presence leaves me feeling like the world is not good, like there is no love here, and like leaves me feeling like there's like, I don't know how to describe it, but an emptiness, um, doubting whether my own life even has any meaning at all, or whether I should even be here, or things like that. That's an example of a person that's bad for me. Um, so if someone pulls you out of balance or brings out the uh, qualities or characteristics that you don't prefer within yourself, that you don't want to be or that you're actively working to improve and if a person brings out the worst in you like if you watch content for example and afterwards you're more judgmental towards others and afterwards you're more of a mean person and it causes you to act negatively um, or brings out negative angry hateful qualities within yourself or something like that, according to my definition, I would say that person is bad for you. So that's what I mean by bad. Um, but I like, I guess I do believe that some people are bad for us and some people are good for us because I also like, well, I just see this, right? Like just as a human in the world, you can see it. Um, but I think I was bringing it up in the video because I was saying like, there, it's possible that a person like any given person is not fundamentally good or bad. Um, it's whether they're good or bad for another person. Like this, so that's overall true. Um, but like, for 
example, a specific spiritual teacher, like someone who might be like kind of intense, like Tony Robbins or something like that, can be the perfect medicine for one individual on their journey and can be really good for that person. But for another person, can be actually really a bad presence and bring out the worst in their character. So the same energy of one individual can be good for one and bad for another and perhaps neutral for another. Um, and that's what I mean by like, it's not about asking like, is this a person good or bad and making a final judgment. We are not to judge that. But it's about asking, is this person good or bad for me or neutral for me right now on my journey according to the goals and objectives about who and how I would like to be and the qualities and characteristics within myself that I'm wishing to cultivate. Is this person good for me or bad for me or neutral for me? Um, and you can see in synastry like someone that's good for you, maybe there's synastry with uh, the sun, Jupiter, Venus, uh, real nice aspects. Maybe someone that's more bad for you, maybe it's Mars, you know, in your synastry. Um, maybe, or maybe Saturn. Saturn, I, I've come to love like more, but maybe it's Saturn and Mars and Pluto aspects, hard aspects to your chart. And like that person overall, their presence causes greater conflict within you and strife. And it's just not a match. So that's what I mean by like if a person is good for you or if a person is not good for you. And a person being bad for you does not necessarily mean that they are a bad person, if that makes sense. And that's the main point I wanted to make is, you know, someone is, the, is perfect for, everyone is perfect for someone. Does that make sense? Um, or something. Everyone is born for a purpose, even really, like, even, like, really, like, antisocial psychopaths. There's, there's a reason, there's, there's a role, there's some, there is a, something for them to do in this world. They're here for a reason. There are theories that they're here for very specific um, military purposes, right? Like, that's why they exist in the population, things like that. Um, there's a role and a reason for each personality. Um, but... Not everyone is good for everyone else. So sometimes it's best to keep our distance from those that um, pull us out of alignment with who we wish to be, where, where possible and where we can. So, yes, but each person was made as they are for a reason. Um, and if we had the eyes of God, the eyes of the divine, we would know what that reason is. And I'm blessed sometimes in readings to get to see the reason um, and to come to know it. And that's given me regret great deal of compassion for all. So thank you for watching today's video and joining me.